as an investor across our various different strategies. Um, so that that's just a little bit of background on the firm itself. Here you can see our AUM growth. We've seen uh, quite substantial growth since inception, uh, starting in 2016. Now, one thing I would mention here is Equiton is a fully integrated company. And really what that means is we handle everything within the Equiton ecosystem, all aspects of the business, acquisitions, developments, property management, it's all handled internally. And I think why that's a good thing is it allows for greater fluidity when you're executing your strategy. Sometimes what we see, and there's nothing wrong with this, is asset managers will use third-party development teams, or they might use third-party property managers. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. But one of the things that you can run into is barriers to communication. It's far easier to control your outcome when it's all handled internally. So we, we do everything from construction, sales, marketing, uh, it's all managed within the ecosystem here. So why private real estate? You know, why is this a investment class that you would want to look at? And one of the things that I always like to start with is just real life examples. Um, I work with many different individuals, many different clients, people who are new to the space, people, ultra high net worth individuals have, who are very familiar with real estate. And I would say, you know, there's a few key indicators here. Um, one of them is owning physical real estate in Canada is becoming increasingly more challenging, as you might all know. Down payment requirements, financing, fluctuating interest rates, and ultimately owning a property. You know, I have some clients who own multiple rental properties, and the reality is they're just tired of being a landlord. Uh, being a landlord is a part-time job on a good, a good day. It's a full-time job on a bad day. So it's time consuming. It's also capital intensive. This is really an alternative or what I would say is a compliment for people who like real estate, but they just don't want to deal with the headaches of owning physical property. So this is a great way to get some exposure uh, to the space again, without the downside of actually having to own a property. Another, you know, indicator is why you want to be invested in the private markets. This is a very interesting graph here. So what you see in front of you is actually the private Canadian apartment index. And this has been tracked by MSCI, which is Morgan Stanley, uh, since 1984. And what they found is the private Canadian apartment space since 1984 has never actually had a negative year. It very much speaks to the consistency of this asset class. And we'll dive a little bit into why that is and how it's able to maintain the kind of consistency that we've seen since the 80s. It's likely that that figure goes back even further. Um, however, they didn't start tracking it until 1984. So, you know, what is, you know, what, what's the difference between private and public? And this is the question that I get the most frequently, I would say, is when people hear the term private equity or private real estate, um, there's almost this aura of mystique around it. Uh, people aren't really sure what to think of it. It's right, really quite simple when you break it down. When you look at a public investment, and this is an investment that generally trades on a form of an exchange, S&P 500, TSX, NASDAQ, these are all exchanges that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Uh, the great thing about public stocks is you can buy them really at a touch of a button now. They make it super easy. Uh, apps like Robinhood, Wealthsimple, et cetera. Private investments like ours do not trade on an exchange. So why is that important? Why is that a good thing? Well, what happens, and we've been seeing this especially since 2020, it's a perfect example in the last four years, is we've seen immense volatility. When COVID-19 hit, this is back in 2020, we essentially saw a full retreat, a capitulation in the public markets, huge swings uh, down. All of a sudden, the government lowers interest rates to zero. We start seeing some more activity. In fact, many stocks then hit all-time highs, uh, and you're seeing a complete swing in the opposite direction. Uh, all of a sudden, interest rates start moving up as inflation starts moving up. The government and the Bank of Canada need to control this. And what happens is you start to see selling pressure in the markets. It's almost like a yo-yo or a roller coaster. So you start to see a lot of volatility. Why does this happen? Well, there's a few different reasons. The most prominent one, I would say, is it really comes down to the emotions and irrationalities of individuals. When people are excited about something, they tend to buy, buy, buy. And this was, you know, the, the case in COVID. There was a lot of FOMO or fear of missing out. People wanted to be involved. Uh, on the adverse, however, interest rates move up. 
military conflicts break up. We're seeing you know conflicts in 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 Europe as well as the Middle East. Uh, there's political changes, and what that does is it causes some panic or uncertainty. And naturally, people are inclined to sell their investment. And that selling feature then puts negative pressure on the market. So that's where you start to see the volatility. Private investments do not trade on the exchange. And the benefit of that is we are uncorrelated to public market volatility. In fact, we're able to circumvent that volatility completely. Uh, our investments are far more the result of the performance of the underlying asset as opposed to how the market feels about it. A, a really great saying that I heard and, and one that I, I like to use quite frequently is a company on the public markets can be just as profitable on a Monday as it is on a Friday, but in that period of time, it can lose 20% of its share value. Uh, it's not necessarily indicative of how well that company is performing. So the great thing about private investments is the consistency, lower volatility. The one downside I would say is the holding periods. And this is what we refer to as liquidity, stocks, daily liquidity. Some of our investments have monthly liquidity, others have no liquidity, so no access to your capital. Now, why that's a great thing is it reduces volatility, but also from an accessibility standpoint, it's not always as easy to get access to your capital. And we'll, we'll break it down a little bit more and talk about what the liquidity looks like depending on the investments. So what you see in front of you here is the three different offerings that we have. We only have three and we'll keep it simple. The offerings are bifurcated or really broken down into two different sections. We have our funds, and you'll notice that on the left and in the middle here is our two funds, and we have our developments. So what's the difference? You know, how do they differentiate? Well, funds are diversified. So the great thing about it is you get diversified exposure to multiple different assets, multiple different asset classes. Funds are also cash flowing. So both of the ones that we have issue monthly distributions. Every single month, it's like clockwork. We've never missed a distribution since the inception of the company. The final thing about funds is they have liquidity. So the two that you see here have monthly liquidity, the ability to buy and sell on a monthly basis. The one catch I would say is with both of these strategies, there is what we call a soft holding period. And really what that means is we expect clients to be comfortable with a three-year hold. So we, you know, at the end of the day, what this is, is it's a real estate. And real estate is a long-term buy and hold strategy. What we don't want is we don't want people coming into the fund for a short period of time and then leaving after a short period of time. So it's a three-year soft hold. However, you do have the ability to buy and sell on a monthly basis if you really need access to your capital. Now, on the right side here, we have our developments. And these are what I call pure play development strategies. And the great thing about it, as you guys will notice here, is the returns. It's generally going to be the most lucrative form of investing in the private real estate space. Developments are concentrated investments. So opposed from the funds, which give you diversified exposure, developments are generally going to be concentrated into the completion and construction of a single building. Developments are non-cash flowing. So there's no cash flow being generated off these strategies. All the profits are going to be realized at the end of that completion period. And then finally, developments are e-liquid. So in the case of the one that we currently have, it's a five-year project. You have to be comfortable with a five-year hold. If you commit capital to that kind of a strategy, your funds are locked up for the duration of that period. So you know the, the great thing about it is there's really an offering for everyone. Everyone's going to have different uh, time horizons. They're going to have different risk tolerances. Um, I work with younger people who have long time horizons. Maybe they're using RSPs. Um, they can afford to do developments. They're looking for higher growth. I also work with some people who are in retirement and maybe they're looking for cash flow and they're looking for consistent conservative cash flow. That's where the apartment fund would more suit their needs. So it's really about having breadth um, and, and, you know, a diverse set of offerings depending on someone's uh, desires and someone's end result. So what we'll do here is we'll dive a little bit into the apartment fund. Then we'll talk about the income and development fund. And then finally, we'll talk about our current pure play development offering and really give you guys a sense of how these investments work uh, from the inside out. 
So the apartment fund, and this is the eight to 12% here. I might add that these investments do have minimum investment requirements associated with them. So the apartment fund would have a minimum investment requirement of 25,000. The income and development fund would be 5,000. And the pure play development offerings are 25,000. All of them can be utilized with an RSP, TFSA, Lira, RIF, whatever registered account it might be. So the apartment fund, the eight to 12% here. This is the flagship fund. It's our longest standing offering. It is also the most conservative investment that we have. It's been around since 2016. And really the goal here, the strategy that we're implementing, and this is our bread and butter, is what you call a value add strategy. So we're not necessarily looking to go out and acquire the latest and greatest buildings. Really what we're doing is we're looking for under-optimized or underperforming assets. And the great thing about buying under-optimized assets is there's the opportunity to optimize them, right? To close what we call a gap to market. So it, I think about it this way. If a car, for example, is performing at 60% optimization, well, there's a 40% gap to get it to 100%. It's the same thing with real estate assets. There's the opportunity to close that gap to market and therefore make the investment more profitable. And I'll, I'll highlight some examples that we've done in the past a little bit later on, but that's really the core of the strategy with this specific fund. Currently, the fund has an, an AUM or assets under management of about 965 million. Interestingly enough, when we started this fund back in 2016, it was one property in Stratford, Ontario. It's still in the fund today. Uh, and it was valued at around 22 million. Now we're at 34 buildings in the fund valued at close to 965 million. We have about 2,700 units across the portfolio. And you as an investor have access or exposure to all buildings within the fund. You're not concentrated into any specific building, which is great from a, a risk standpoint and diversification. So looking at the portfolio, you know, where, where do we like to focus? What are the markets that we like to be in? Well, I would say a core of the portfolio is located in southwestern Ontario. 32 of the properties specifically are all the way from Kingston in the east down to Chatham in the, in the far southwest. And the reason why we like to focus on this market is the Golden Horseshoe region in southwestern Ontario makes up approximately a quarter of Canada's GDP. It makes up about two thirds of Ontario's GDP. It's really the economic stronghold of this country. It's a market that we understand very well. Most of the team, the leadership team with Equiton has been operating in this space throughout their entire careers, uh, on average about 25 years amongst uh, each individual. This is an area that we're very comfortable with. And for that reason, it's an area that we want the core of the fund to be located in. The other thing I would add here, and this is also very interesting, why group together properties? Why is it important to group together properties? Well, this is really what would be referred to as economies of scale. So one of the great thing about, uh, things about having properties in close proximity to each other is it's far easier to maintain them. You have to imagine that these buildings, these apartment buildings, valued anywhere from 20 to $50 million, uh, there's a lot of maintenance that goes into them. By having them within proximity of each other, it's less time consuming and it's less capital intensive. We have access to the electricians. We have access to the plumbers, uh, whoever it might be, to go and do work on those existing properties. So it, it, it's not only great um, from a market standpoint being in southwestern Ontario, but it also just makes sense from a logistic standpoint. We've also decided to expand into Edmonton, Alberta. So we acquired two properties out there. The idea moving forward is that we're going to continue to look for opportunities in the greater uh, in the Golden Horseshoe region. We're also looking out west in the greater Vancouver area, and we're looking at Montreal. So over time, what will happen is as we continue to raise capital, we'll go out and we're, we'll acquire assets in various different parts of the Canadian market. Uh, one of the great things about that is one diversification and just getting exposure to all different aspects of, of Canada. So just an example of, of, of you know, how this fund actually operates. And the idea, again, is to continue to acquire assets. These are two properties that you'll see here that we acquired last year. 
And as many of you know, last year with interest rates being as high as they were, um, you know, it was a little more challenging to find great opportunities, but we managed to finish off the year with a bang. This one being acquired in uh, November, this is a property in London, Ontario, and then followed by a property in Brantford, Ontario in December. This one actually just made sense for us. We own the, the neighboring property in Brantford, uh, Brantford that's adjacent to this one. So from a logistics standpoint, it worked out great. So how do the returns actually work? I mean, it's so easy to say eight to 12% is the target, but how do you actually get to the eight to 12%? So what I like to do is I just like to break down the two different components that make that eight to 12%. So if we look at it here, we have the five to 6% monthly distribution and we have the two to 6% capital appreciation. So what does that actually mean? Let's break it down a little bit. Monthly distribution, five to 6% is an annual number. Our distributions are paid out monthly. So let's say it's 6%, a nice even number. You're looking at about 0.5% every single month in distributions. So how are we getting that? Well, it really comes down to the rental income, right? You have to imagine a portfolio of 34 apartment buildings. That's a lot of rent collection that we're making on a monthly basis. The proceeds that we're receiving from our tenants flow to the clients within the fund. So that is the monthly cash flow. And again, that makes up approximately 6% of the total 8 to 12%. The remaining returns are realized through what we call capital appreciation. And this makes up about 2 to 6% of the 8 to 12%. And capital appreciation is really just the value of these buildings moving up over time. One of the genius aspects of this fund is how we're able to capture the capital appreciation. How do you actually reflect the increase of an asset in, in, in a passive investment? Well, the way that we've done it is we appraise every single one of the buildings in the fund on a quarterly basis. So four times a year, what we'll do is we'll have CBRE appraise every single building. And why that's beneficial is it's because it allows us to accurately reflect the value of the buildings on a quarterly basis into the unit price of the investment. Okay, so that allow us to, uh, allow us, as, us to have the most accurate unit price possible. So when you combine the cash flow with the appreciation component, you end up with a result of eight to 12%. Um, you know, to simplify it, I would say the closest example I can think of is it's very similar to owning your own rental property. If you have a rental property, you're really going to benefit from two ways. You're going to benefit from the monthly cash flow that you're receiving from your tenant, but you're also going to realize a gain on that property when you go to sell it. Let's say you, you hold the rental property for five years, you buy it for $100,000, you sell it for $200,000, you've realized $100,000 on that investment. So it's a very similar structure. The main difference, however, is that Equiton handles all aspects of the fund. We handle the financing, we handle the property management. There's nothing that needs to be done uh, from a, a client perspective. So we, we look at the eight to 12%. How has the investment actually performed over the course of its life? This is based on historical returns. So this is actually looking back in time at the returns that we've received on an annual basis. A $100,000 investment invested in our vanilla class A drip, which is just the, the standard class, would now be worth approximately $195,000. That also represents 95 consecutive months worth of, posit uh, of distributions and positive returns. So since inception of the company, we've never missed a cash flow payment. We've never had a negative month. It's very much consistent because the underlying assets are consistent. The only thing that I might add here is just going back one slide, and I think some of you may, may have been thinking of this question, so I'll just go back quickly, is with the cash flow, what can you do with the cash flow? You have really two options here. You can choose to reinvest it, very similar to reinvesting a dividend with a publicly traded stock, or you can receive it as cash. You know, It's really up to the individual. Uh, if you're in retirement and you need some additional cash flow to supplement your retirement lifestyle, you would absolutely opt in for a cash distribution where Equiton would pay you monthly. The alternative is you reinvest it every single month through a distribution reinvestment program. 
it's very easy to change it. So for any one of my clients who wants to start with drip, they want to start reinvesting. And then maybe later on, three, four years later, they want to switch to cash. It's interchangeable. They can switch it on a monthly basis if they require. The one benefit of reinvesting here is some of you may have noticed at the bottom is you do receive a 2% discount on reinvested units. And, and just to conceptualize that, let's say the unit price is $10. When you go to reinvest your cash flow every month, instead of repurchasing units at $10, you'd be purchasing them at a discount of $9.80, representing a 2% discount. So it, you know, it doesn't necessarily have a huge impact immediately, but over the long run, it does have a significant impact to how well your investment will compound over time. So just looking at results, I mean, these are the net calendar year returns. And it is very important to note here that every single number that I'm showing you in front of your screen is a net number. So that's after any sort of fee has, has been paid out. This is the bottom line return. Uh, we've had a tremendous five years. If you look just at the bottom here, the five-year net trailing return is approximately 10.6%. That represents an, on average, 10.6% return year over year for the last five years. I would like to highlight one specific year here. If we look at 2020, and 2020 was really the darkest days of COVID-19. I mean, this was absolutely when uncertainty was at its highest. There was a lot of, um, you know, what I would say is nervousness in the marketplace. This fund still managed to produce a return of 7.83%. Yes, it's slightly lower than that 8% target that we that we aim to achieve. Uh, it's still a very good return given where the uncertainty was. So what? why is that important? Well, even in one of the most black swan events in the last century, a private fund like this still managed to perform exceptionally well. Okay, so that that is the important thing that I would highlight on this specific page. And of course, after this webinar, uh, if you are curious in terms of receiving and looking through some of this information on your own time, a great starting place is the Equiton website. All of this information is accessible. We're a very transparent company. It's all accessible via the website. So we're looking at the returns. We've talked about how we get to the eight to 12%. We've talked about the cash flow and the breakdown. I, I just want to sort of gift wrap everything and, and, and use an example here of how we're actually implementing this value add strategy. This is a property we acquired in Hamilton, Ontario, and this was back in March of 2021. What we actually did is what you call a door knock. So this is where you go up to the building owner and you say, hey, is it okay if we take a look around? Um, what we noticed were a few opportunities here. This was a privately owned building, first of all. It was owned by an older gentleman. And which is not a bad thing, but one of the issues you can run into is lack of resources. Uh, it's very expensive to manage these buildings. The entire penthouse floor here, so at the top here, was uninhabitable. It was completely flooded. There was leaks. No one was living on the penthouse floor. And as you might know, penthouse units are generally the most profitable units in a building. So that was an opportunity for us. The other thing that we saw is they had a lot of administrative space, a lot of existing security space that wasn't being utilized effectively. That was a low hanging fruit for us. So one of the things that we did is we acquired the asset. We went into it, we completely gutted the penthouse floor, completely renovated it. We turned it into a livable space where people could actually live and pay rent. The other thing that we did is we utilized the space more effectively. So we actually went in and we added additional units where that existing storage space was. Why that's important is because it increases profitability, right? If you add six additional units, well, that's six additional units that are gonna increase profitability on a month to month basis. So the great thing is not only were we able to increase cash flow. But by upgrading the building and injecting resource or capital into it, we are also able to increase the overall value of the building itself. When you look at an apartment building like this, really the way that you're going to determine its value is how profitable it is. Usually they're looking at the last 12 months, right? They're looking at the last 12 months of profitability and an appraisal will make will, will, will give you an estimate on the, the value of that building. Our most recent appraisal, and this is all done by CBRE, which is a, a very reputable uh, real estate group in North America. 
the most re, uh, recent appraisal valuation is about 91.4 million. So you can see the kind of value that's been added to the fund and to the clients within the fund. And that's really the objective whenever we go out and we acquire an, an asset. So that's really the apartment fund in a nutshell. The, the things that I would summarize here is that this is a cash flowing investment and it gives you access to multiple different apartment buildings spread throughout Southwestern Ontario. Of course, it can be used uh, you know, using an RSP or a TFSA. The other thing I would note here, and some of you may have noticed this tax efficiency part, I'm not gonna go too into it today because uh, I could talk about it for 15, 20 minutes. But I will say the apartment fund is one of the most tax efficient investments you could possibly get access to in this country. It's what you call a return of capital. Uh, and of course, for anyone who's a little bit more curious to learn about it, I'd be happy to explain it more in depth uh, in, in sort of a breakaway meeting. Okay, so there's our apartment fund. So let's get into the income and development fund. And the income development fund, if we go back to that investment overview page that we were looking at, it's the middle one that targets 12 to 16% with a minimum investment requirement of 5,000. So what is this fund? You know, what's actually in it? Well, let's break it down a little bit. The way I like to explain the income and development fund is it's really a composition of income producing assets as well as development completions. So you're getting exposure to both income, you know, lower volatility assets, as well as the higher growth development uh, projects. So let's break it down a little bit further. Let's look at the income producing side. Well, we really do two things at Equiton for this fund. Is one, we focus on commercial properties. So right now in the fund, there are various different commercial properties that generate monthly cash flow for us. The other thing we have access to, and this is a feature of the fund, I would say, it's not something that we're always doing, is financing and lending. It's a small portion of the fund. But the great thing about financing and lending is it allows us to supercharge distributions when we need to, right? It, it really is a, a way for us as a prudent asset manager to be able to go out and add to that monthly cash flow if we need to. So it's more of a feature of the fund. Uh, right now, I don't believe we have any loans that are outstanding. So that's the income producing side. And then we have the development side, which of course I'll, I'll dive a little bit more into in just a second here. Let's talk about the commercial properties. This is an example of some of the commercial properties that we currently have in the fund. Uh, we own both of them outright. One of them you'll notice here is located in London, Ontario. It's called Hyde Park, London. And the great thing about it is it has very high quality anchor tenants. A CIBC bank and a Wendy's a uh, hamburger shop are very reputable companies. Uh, they make a lot of money. They're locked into 10-year fixed lease agreements with us. They have an obligation to pay Equiton on a monthly basis. Very similar to the apartment fund. That cash flow that we're collecting from the commercial properties is being paid out monthly. And it's the same amount. It's about 5 to 6%, 0.5% every single month. You have the option to receive it as cash or you can reinvest it. The 2% reinvested discount is also uh, accessible through this fund. So the other one you'll notice here is the beer store. And, and I love the beer store because a lot of people go, oh, you know, why would you want something like that in a fund? Well, the great thing about it is it's essentially a monopoly. If you look at the, the owners of the beer store, you're talking about three of the largest breweries in the world, uh, Labatt, Molson, and Sleeman. Um, Absolutely, we're going to want an asset like this within the fund. It's a very high quality tenant to have. So this uh, this beer store was recently rolled into the fund uh, about six months ago. So that just gives you an idea of the of the commercial properties. And again, it's approximately six percent cash flow that's being acquired uh, from the commercial properties as well as the financing and lending on an annual basis. Let's talk about the developments, and this is where this fund gets very exciting because most of the returns that you see in the 12 to 16% mark are gonna be derived through development completions. Let's talk about the first one. We currently have three, we're looking to add a fourth. This is the one that's coming up for completion the soonest. This is Marquee Modern Townhomes located in Guelph, Ontario. So really what we're doing here is we're building 96 townhomes in Guelph. And the idea is to sell these townhomes off completely. And what will happen is when the, the townhomes are occupied and the new homeowners move into their units, a profitability event will occur to the clients within this fund. 
it's what we call a special distribution. So it's essentially a lump sum payment as a result of this development completion. You can see the estimated completion value here is about 61 million. So all of the clients within this fund will partake in the profitability uh, that will be derived from, from the completion of this project. This one is expected to be completed uh, fourth quarter of 2024 this year or the first quarter of 2025. So we're actively finishing up construction. Uh, it's nearing completion. So that's the first one. And here's just an overview, ju just to give you a sense of the location uh, for Marquee Modern Townhomes. There is a website specifically designated for this project as well. So for anyone who's curious, you can just look up Marquee Modern Townhome uh, and it will bring you directly to that website. So here's another one. This is a second development that we have in the fund. And this is a great project. It's called Vicinity Condos. It was actually recently rebranded to Cool Condos. Anyone living on the Queensway in the West End of Toronto, you likely have seen some of the marketing and, and uh, advertising that we're doing for Cool Condos. It, it really is incredible. And what this is, is it's an 11-story mid-rise being built on 875 the Queensway, which is really on the fringe of Etobicoke in Toronto. It's a little bit of a longer project. I mean, we started this one about a year ago. So the expected completion here is about fourth quarter of 2026. The exact same thing will occur as what will happen with Marquee Modern Townhomes. When it is fully completed and construction is done and the new homeowners have moved in, a profitability event will occur and that special distribution will then be paid out. So you have access to multiple different development completions within the fund. Great thing about this project is it's zoning approved. So we got the approval on it. Right now we're in the midst of selling some of those units pre-construction, and then we'll get the financing for construction and bring it to the finish line. So the, the other thing I would highlight here is Equiton, it's great because Equiton sort of in every single process of the development life cycle. We have a project that's nearing completion. We have one that's in construction. We have one that's been zoning approved. We have one that's in the zoning phase. So it's nice to know that we, we have our hands in every different aspect uh, of a development life cycle at the moment. And I can elaborate on that uh, a little bit later on in the presentation. So the third development in this one, and this is quite a large project, this is Sandstone's condo. This one's being built on the east side of Toronto in the Cliffside neighborhood, which is just adjacent to the Beaches neighborhood in Toronto. 2257 Kingston Road is the exact location. Uh, it's a large project, as I mentioned, about $285 million is the expected completion value. Right now, this project is in the zoning phase. We're actively going back and forth with the municipality, looking to get approval on it. Once we get that approval, we'll get into pre-construction sales, financing construction, and then completion. So this one is expected to be completed uh, fourth quarter of 2027 or first quarter of 2028. So the same thing, profitability event will occur with this one as well. So how has this fund performed historically? It's a little bit of a younger fund. It hasn't been around as long as the apartment fund. And, you know, 2019 is really the inception date here. $100,000 investment invested in our class A, reinvesting the cash flow would now be worth just under $150,000. So it has performed exceptionally well. Similar to the apartment fund, this fund has never had a negative month and we've never missed a distribution. So I believe we're running on about 50 months uh, of consecutive distributions with this one uh, at this point. This is an important slide to highlight and I really wanna put some emphasis here. When you look at the total returns, 12 to 16%, this is over a 10 year period. So you have to look at this fund over a 10 year, if you take every single year, what would the average look like? What would happen if you smoothed it out? Because you'll notice immediately, and I have questions about this all the time, uh, clients will go, hey, Devin, you know, the target, uh, the target here is 12 to 16, but in 2023, and in 2022, the fund only did 6%. Well, that's well below the target. Why is that? The reason why this happens is we expect to complete developments on average every other year. So why that's important is because in years that we don't have a development completion, the returns are inevitably going to be lower than the target, right? There's no development profitability occurring there. So all the returns are being generated from the commercial properties and the financing and lending. In years that we do have a development completion, however, you can expect that the returns would be within that 12 to 16% range, if not exceed 
the 12 to 16 percent range. You really have to look at it over a 10 year period, year by year by year. And you'll notice in 2021 here, we had a, a, a year that was well within the target range. Last year, it was slightly below 2023, uh, 2022, excuse me, it was slightly below 2023, it was slightly lower. The great thing is moving forward, we have the Guelph project coming up this year or early next year. We have our vicinity condos project coming up. We have sandstones coming up. And then the fourth uh, project, which I'll get into in just a second. So there's plenty of development opportunities uh, to look forward to moving forward, which is the exciting part about this fund. Okay, so that's the income and development fund there for you. Uh, and that's really the two fund strategies that we focus on. The third and final strategy here, and if we just think uh, quickly think back to that investment overview slide, the far right, the 16 to 20% is the pure play developments. And I'll highlight the project that we currently have available. Because what happens with these developments is we only go out to the market looking for so much capital, right? We'll set a limit on how much capital we raise. For 1099 Broadview, which is the project you see in front of you here, we're only raising 32 million for it. So what will happen is when we hit that mark, we'll close the project for allocations and it will no longer be accessible. This is the latest and greatest 1099 Broadview being built in the heart of Danforth, Toronto. Let's go over some of the KPIs here and talk a little bit about how developments actually work. It's a very interesting space. So our intention here is to do a mid-rise 12-story condo with about 355 units in the Danforth area of Toronto, more commonly referred to as Greek Town, is what I think a lot of people uh, would, would be more familiar with. It has a completion value of about 386 million. It's a 5.2 year project. We're targeting annual net returns of 20%. So if we do 5.2 years over uh, by 20%, you're looking at total returns of about 103% net. The expectation here is that we double investor capital on this project. We'll break down the location, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about the development life cycle because I always think it's important to highlight how these, you know, how the operations actually work. The minimum investment here, as I mentioned earlier, is twenty-five thousand. And the great thing about this project and developments in general that Equiton does is you can use RSPs and you can use Liras, which are naturally going to be longer term registered accounts. It makes sense to pair a long term development project like this with a longer term registered account like a Lira or like an RSP. So here's the actual timeline for 1099 Broadview. And generally, when you look at a development, you can break it down into five different sections. The first one is going to be acquisition. The second one is going to be site plan approval and permitting. This is what we call entitlement or the entitlement process. You then get into pre-construction sales, then you get into construction, and then finally occupancy. Okay. Right now, we're at the acquisition phase. We just started the project. We actually acquired the land parcel for about $26.5 million. We've already had it appraised for about $33.6 million. So we've already seen about a 30% increase just in the appraisal valuation. And there's a great story, uh, a background story in terms of how we were able to get it at such a discounted value. I could talk about it for hours, uh, but for the sake of this webinar, I'll, I'll keep it as short as I can here. What will happen once we get into the zoning and approval phase is we'll go back and forth with the city and we'll submit a proposal. We'll say, hey, city, we're looking to build a 12-story mid-rise with 355 units, X levels of parking, and we want to paint the building white, for example. And the city will look at that and they'll, they'll choose to approve it or they'll choose to provide us with some feedback. Once we receive zoning approval, site plan approval, and building permits, we'll then get into pre-construction sales. The rule of thumb in Canada, and I was telling Maria a little bit about this, is you have to sell about 70% of the units pre-construction in order to get financing from a major bank. So a bank will give you financing as long as they know there's sufficient collateral uh, in the form of pre-construction sales. So once we get that 70% mark, we'll get into construction. Once you get into construction, it's fairly smooth sailing to the finish line. It's not difficult to build a 12-story condo where you just go straight up. It's far more complex when you're building a, a townhome community, uh, something that needs sidewalks, infrastructure, things like that. So construction for us is really, you know, at that point, it's smooth sailing to the finish line. 
once this occupancy event occurs, what will happen is the clients that are invested in this development project will receive their profits. They will receive that lump sum payment. A $25,000 investment based on our targeted returns is expected to return over $50,000. So we're hoping to double client money here. Just to give you a sense of the location for 1099, and, and really one of the interesting things about developments, just going back a slide here, is when we start a project like this, we're actually looking at the occupancy phase. We're trying to figure out who our target demographic would be and why that demographic would want to live in a specific location. So if we look at 1099 Broadview, we've identified a few different demographics. One of them is going to be younger families, uh, maybe in their early 30s. The other one is an aging demographic. So what we see is generally people from the ages of 50 to maybe 65. What happens is they own their primary residence and their children. They go off to university, they come back. All of a sudden, they're left with an empty nest because the children go off and rent a, a place closer to the downtown core. It doesn't make sense to own a primary residence with, let's say, four beds. So naturally, you look to downsize. Okay, And where do you downsize to? Condo units are a great place to do it. So that is another group or another demographic that we're looking to capture. What would a young family or an aging demographic want? You have to look at lifestyle and you have to look at accessibility. Those are the two most important factors that go into a, loca a location for development. Let's start with the accessibility a little bit here. Accessibility, as the name implies, is really just how easy is it to get to the downtown core or areas within the city. I would say it's becoming increasingly more important, especially as density in the city is starting to increase. Great thing about this area is you have access to the DVP or the Don Valley Parkway, which is a primary artery uh, within Toronto, which brings you directly into the downtown core. As you can see up here, it's approximately a 15 minute drive to the downtown core from this location. The other thing is you want to look at how can you get around the city via public transportation? Not everyone drives a car. Broadview Station, which is one of the major subway stations along the east-west line of the TTC, is less than a kilometer south. It's about a 13 or 14 minute walk away from the location. There's also a bus stop just outside the location here. So it's very easy to get around the city, whether you're driving and you want to take the DVP, or maybe you want to go to the Danforth across the Bloor and go south, or if you're taking public transportation, you have access to really the entire east-west line, including Broadview Station, which is you know just a few minutes, you know, 10 minutes away uh, south. So accessibility checks all the boxes. Uh, in fact, for this location, we managed to score 100 uh, on, on uh, transportation or, or commute times from realtor.com. So it's a very good area uh, in terms of accessibility. The other thing we're going to look at is lifestyle. And when you look at lifestyle, you have to take into account your demographic, your end user. A young professional, someone in their early 20s, mid 20s, is going to have a far different lifestyle than an, a young family or an aging demographic, right? A young professional might want to be in the downtown core. They want to be close to their office. They want to be near the coolest bars or clubs, things like that. The demographic that we're looking for, we feel they want access to green space. We feel they want access to great bespoke coffee stores and restaurants. They also need access to healthcare. So the great thing about this location is you have the Don Valley trail system just north. It's a whole you know, network of different trail systems and green spaces just north of the location. It's a great way to spend the weekend. Uh, if you're a younger family, you can take the children. It, it's a cost-effective way, <laughs> quite frankly, to spend that weekend. The other thing is healthcare, which I would say is very important. Uh, especially with younger families and, and, and older couples. Michael Guerin Hospital is about 15 minutes away from this location, just east. So you have access to a primary hospital from this location. And the other thing is you have access to Danforth, uh, which has some of the best restaurants in the city. And many of you may be familiar with Taste of the Danforth, uh, which is a huge uh, food festival that takes place annually in the city of Toronto. So it really encompasses all aspects of the lifestyle, as well as accessibility. And that's just one of the many reasons why we decided to go forward with 1099 Broadview. 
So, uh, you know, that really summarizes the investments at Equiton. And I hope I was able to explain the private space and, and some of the investments in greater detail. I just want to thank everyone again for having me on the panel. I think at this point, Maria, if, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong here. I think we're going to open up the chat box just for some Q&As and we can spend about 10 to 15 minutes on that. Yeah. So first of all, I just want to say thank you, Devin. That was a fantastic presentation. I learned a lot throughout that presentation. I personally invest with Equiton in the apartment fund. So I'm much more familiar with that fund than the other two that you mentioned, but just even speaking to those two, so many great opportunities that Equiton has found um, and, and being able to create value for investors and you know the tenants alike as well because those are the individuals who are who are really living there and and um and and, and equiton is helping on on both ends of that which is phenomenal to see and very hands-on in that sense so uh fantastic presentation what i'm going to do is i actually took down some questions myself that i had throughout the presentation um so i'm going to take this time as others if you have any questions please feel free to put them in the chat box so as i'm going through the questions that i've got here Put them in the chat box. We'll go over that really quick as well. Um, so first question that I wanted to ask, and I think you touched on this, but just to clarify, so the returns or the growth that people are seeing, uh, they're classified as return on capital instead of interest or dividends, let's say. So essentially, those earnings um, are not taxable as income. So as you said, it's more tax efficient, right? Yeah, so that would be a feature specifically of the apartment fund. So Maria, the, the investment that you're currently in is 100% at the moment return of capital. And I guess I'll just go into it a little bit. So what return of capital is, in the eyes of the CRA, so when they look at this strategy from a tax perspective, they see Equiton every month returning a portion of the investor's capital back to them. Okay, so why is that important? Well, it's really a deferred tax strategy you don't pay taxes on the monthly cash flow. Okay, you're not paying any taxes. In fact, you don't pay taxes until you sell the investment. Naturally, what happens is when you sell the investment, that will trigger a profitability event, which will then trigger a taxation event. At that point, you would be taxed as capital gains, which in this country is the most efficient way to be taxed. Uh, and of course, uh, if anyone's curious about the specifics of it, I'm always happy to go into greater detail. Perfect. And then, you know, talking about the, the fund, fund specifically, which ones would you recommend for, and again, I believe you did touch on this, but which ones you recommend for um, individuals who are more on the conservative or low risk tolerance side of the investment scene versus a high risk tolerance individual? Yeah, re really great question. And again, it's a case by case basis. So if you're someone who's more conservative, uh, you're looking for greater consistency, the apartment fund would be the investment you would want exposure to. If you're someone who's approaching retirement or in retirement and you need that monthly cash flow to help supplement your lifestyle, the apartment fund absolutely makes sense. If you're someone who's looking for growth and you're looking for pure growth, longer time horizon, you're okay with e-liquidity, right? So you're okay having your capital invested for you know five years, for example. You would want to look at doing a development and then you have some people that are looking for a balance, right? They're looking for a mix. They want the cash flow, but they also want access to some of the higher returns that are received from development completion. So in that case, the income and development fund would make sense. So again, the great thing about it is really Equiton has strategies and offerings for you know all sorts of different desires, people who are more conservative, you know, less conservative people that want growth, time horizons, et cetera. So it's really a case by case basis. And every single client I have uh, before they're even invested is we go through the education and we talk about their circumstances. We talk about their situation and what kind of outcome they want. And based on what they want and what I hear, I'm able to then cater a specific strategy to that to that desire. And, and that's phenomenal. So that's that's answered that perfectly. Um, just another question here. So if someone does want to or needs to access the fund more short term, let's say a year, two years, is that an option at all? And if so, what is the process to be able to access that? Or are there any downsides to that, let's say? Yeah, great question. Um, in turn, this is what we refer to as a redemption. So selling your investment in the private space, the fancy term for it is redeeming your investment. 
And absolutely with the funds, if you invested today and you needed access to your money in let's say six months, you could redeem your investment. You could sell the investment. The one catch, however, is that there would be a penalty if it's sold within that th first three year period. These are not punitive penalties. Just to give you an example, the apartment fund is about three and a half percent in the first 18 months, followed by 3% in the second 18 months. After 36 months or three years, there's no penalty. The really, you know, the, the, the redemption penalties are really just in place to incentivize a long-term hold. It's there to encourage a long-term hold. Uh, but absolutely, if if something comes up and a client of mine needs to sell an investment, uh, we make it happen. Equiton has honored all redemption requests that have come through its doors since inception. That's awesome. I'm, I'm glad that there's an option for that because you'll hear other companies that don't even have that option at, at, at all. Um, so Mark is asking here, great presentation. Thank you, Mark. Uh, is the minimum investment to buy in 25,000 across the board? Yeah, good, good question, Mark. So the apartment fund has a minimum investment of 25,000. The pure play development, which was 1099 Broadview, that was that project that we were looking at in the Danforth that one is 25,000 and the income and development fund, which is sort of the balanced fund, the middle one, that one currently has a minimum of 5,000. The next question I get would be, well, why is the income and development fund 5,000? The reason why is it's just a younger fund. It hasn't been around as long. Um, the other thing is it's a great, it, I would say it's a great segue into the private space. I have some people fresh out of university and they're just looking to get exposure. Uh, to private real estate. So the income and development fund for them, because the minimum is only 5,000, is a great entry point into the space. So that hopefully that that clarifies it. That's that's fantastic. And that's great that Equiton has those different options to um, basically satisfy the different demographics out there, which is phenomenal. So uh, just one last, we'll do one last question here from Sagar. Unless there's more, please feel free to type them in the chat now before we wrap up. Um, how does Equiton plan its property purchases and at what frequency when regards to the apartment fund? Yeah, great question. So we have an acquisition team that's internal here. And the acquisition team is really sifting through hundreds of potential deals on a quarterly basis. So they're actively looking for opportunities. You know, I wouldn't be able to give you a definitive answer. There's no specific time set like, oh, a quarter passes and we need to acquire an asset. As prudent managers, the objective is to acquire an asset that meets that eight to 12% mark and, and acquire an asset in a market that we feel is a good place to be. A great example is last year. Last year, we didn't acquire any assets until November and December. And the reason why we did that was not because there wasn't great opportunities. The thing is, interest rates were coming up, financing's a little bit more unpredictable. But as a manager, our, our objective is not just to have acquisitions every single quarter, it's to have acquisitions that are going to benefit the clients within the fund. So we're we're prudent in that regard. Um, but but I'd say you know we're actively looking at hundreds of potential deals on a quarterly basis. That's amazing. So I think that wraps up all of the questions that we have. It's uh, twelve oh two now, so we'll let people get on with their day. But before we wrap up here, what what I want, do want to say is this: we have our contact information here. Um, you're going to get a copy of this recording through Zoom, and I also will be posting it on my YouTube channel in the next couple of days or so, so you can watch out for that. The one thing that I told myself was, Maria, you have to remember to start the recording right at the beginning, and I think you heard it was a couple minutes <laughs> in, and I said, oh my gosh, I didn't start, so I, I clicked it right there. But regardless, that's when we were kind of getting into the, uh, the the bread and butter of the content. So I think we covered everything that we needed to in that sense. Um, what I want to encourage everyone on here is for is this really quickly. Uh, this is just one of many fantastic ways that you can get into the real estate investing scene. Uh, there are a couple of other, other ways as well in terms of passive, but also active investments as well. So what I want to encourage people and what I've been doing for a lot of investor clients out there that have found tons of value in this is called a real estate action plan. So what that is, it's a financial checkup from the neck up where we're looking at your short term and your long term goals in real estate, whether it's personal acquisitions or investment like acquisitions in the passive and active real estate scene. We're going to talk about current challenges and uh, successes that you've had with real estate investing and then build an action plan to be able to help you reach your short term or long term goals. As Devin was saying, 
real estate is more of a long-term hold. So that's more of what we're looking at in terms of the long-term real estate holding scene. Um, and then we're also going to talk about how can, like, as, as I mentioned, how can we reach those goals, you know, whether you want to retire earlier, get your kids into a property because affordability, uh, you know, is a problem right now and it will be for the foreseeable future, uh, whether it's just having that secondary income, so many different things that can be coupled with your lifestyle to make your money and make your investment work for you. So I highly encourage it's a 30 minute free consultation that we do online like this on google meet or zoom um, send me an email if that's something that you'd like to do my email information is right there maria at motherdaughterteam.ca if you love what you heard with the Equiton presentation today, Devin had so many great points and so many fantastic um, investment funds that you can put your capital towards and see some great returns. Shoot me an email. We'll make that direct connection with Devin to ensure that you know he's setting up an appointment with you to talk about your lifestyle, your needs, as he was mentioning, to see which fund could work best for you and for your investment. So again, I want to thank everyone for joining. I run events like this every 90 days. The next one that I'll be doing is in person. So just make sure that you watch out for your emails for notifications that come in in regards to that. I want to thank Devin so much again. That was an awesome presentation that you put on. I learned so much and I'm positive that all the individuals that joined today also learned so much. Again, been recorded so if you want to go back and look over it that will be posted you'll get a zoom link and that'll also be posted on youtube so thank you again everyone i hope you enjoy this amazing saturday and uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend and we hope that you have an awesome day thank Thanks you again, everyone thank you